please uh, welcome Dr. Sivas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak to you here tonight. Uh, like Dr. Dara, I also have roots in New York City. I did my foundational training in cytology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, did a cytology fellowship, and then I did a research fellowship at Sloan Kettering as well. So I have really fond memories of living at 1233 York Avenue, <laughs> um, the building I walked past on the way over here this evening to give this talk. I remember wonderful across uh, across uh, town trips to Lincoln Center to hear wonderful concerts and to see phenomenal ballet performances and of course wandering the halls of the Metropolitan Museum, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really wonderful to be back here uh, in this amazing city. Um, so if I could have my first slide, uh, please. Is it just this? Um, just the oh, just that. Thank you. Awesome. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to talk about uh, thyroid FNA here. Can I ask, has everybody seen the thyroid FNA here? Do, do we have any thyroid FNA virgins in the audience here? <laughs> Nobody that wants to admit to it. Fantastic. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about here. Uh, and specifically, I'm going to um, really talk about the atypical thyroid FNA, what it is and what it isn't. So I think you're all familiar with the Bethesda system for reporting thyroid FNA specimens. We have six categories, and the recommendation is that every thyroid FNA report should start with one of these six categories. And the one I'm going to focus on this evening, of course, is the third category, uh, which is atypia of undetermined significance or follicular lesion of undetermined significance. Now, what's somewhat unique about the thyroid Bethesda system is unlike other terminologies, we actually have a choice of two names for some of those categories. And that's simply because we didn't come to a consensus on a single name for all six of the categories. Uh, so the idea is that the laboratory would choose the one that they prefer and use it exclusively for that category. So at the, at the Brigham where I am uh, for the third category, we use AUS, atypia of undetermined significance. We never say FLUS. But in Michigan, um, they say FLUS instead of, and they never say AUS. And it's understood that those are synonymous terms. And if you're an endocrinologist or a thyroid surgeon, you've come to learn that in the Bethesda system, these two are identical. So I, I know that there's been a little bit of confusion about that in the past. And I, I've heard that some uh, laboratories have used AUS and FLUS to mean two different things. And um, that's not really standard Bethesda terminology. And we're gonna try to discourage that with the second edition of the Bethesda book. Um, so it is a bit of a grab bag category, this AUS or FLUS, and forgive me if I start using just the term AUS for simplicity, because that's what I'm used to using in our laboratory, but please understand that it's the same as FLUS. Um, it's defined in the blue book as the category for findings that are not convincingly benign, yet the degree of cellular or architectural atypia is simply not sufficient for an interpretation of follicular neoplasm or suspicious for malignancy. We've outlined eight what we call scenarios on two pages of the Bethesda Blue Book. Uh, and if you look through those scenarios, it's pretty clear that this is a very heterogeneous category. <laughs> the usual management is either a repeat FNA and or molecular testing. <laughs> I'm not going to talk much about the management, uh, but I'll be happy to take some questions at the end if you have questions about that. Really, I really want to focus totally on morphology for the rest of this session. So what I'm going to show you now are eight cases, and the question is, is it AUS or not? <laughs> so the first case is a relatively young woman. She's 19 years old. Um, she has a 2.3 centimeter nodule. It's not small and it's not huge. It's somewhere sort of in the middle, but it's described as covering her entire right lobe. And I'll show you a few images. What you see here are a couple of groups of follicular cells, um, but a pretty sparsely cellular specimen that's really mostly blood in the background. There really isn't any colloid. What you're looking at there really is the granular precipitate that you see when you have lysed blood. Let's take a closer look at those two groups of follicular cells. Yeah, they do look like follicular cells. We're in the thyroid, of course, so what else could they be? I mean, there are 
strange zebras that we could think about, but 99% of the time when you're, when you're looking at cells like this, they are of thyroid follicular origin. Do they look like benign appearing follicular cells or is there something a little bit unusual about them? Let me show you a few more. There they are again. I think we'll agree that these look like microfollicles, right? And I'll talk a little bit more in a few minutes about the real the definition of a microfollicle. Um, but what I've shown you is, is two thirds of all the cells that were present on the entire slide. So there were really only six microfollicles in the entire specimen. So what's your diagnosis? Do you call it non-diagnostic because it's sparsely cellular? Do you call it benign? Do you call it AUS? Or do you call it suspicious for a follicular neoplasm? Well, by exclusion, I think the diagnosis really should be AUS. It's not non-diagnostic because you actually have some atypia here. There is architectural atypia in the form of crowded microfollicles. So by definition, you can't call something non-diagnostic if you have recognizable atypia. It's not benign for the same reason because there's atypia. And it's too sparsely cellular to call suspicious for a follicular neoplasm. So in the Bethesda system, um, we define suspicious for a follicular neoplasm as a specimen that's at least moderately cellular. Now, that's very subjective, of course, but I think everybody would agree that when you have just <coughs> six groups of follicular cells, you're not going to call that moderately cellular. This one's a pretty straightforward, sparsely cellular specimen, and most people would feel uncomfortable calling something suspicious for follicular neoplasm on such a sparsely cellular specimen. So we did call it AUS, um, and then we gave a short description saying follicular cells show architectural HB. We don't go into great lengths describing these specimens. Uh, we're, we're busy people like you, like you guys are. So this is pretty standard for what our reports typically look like. And our endocrinologists are delighted because they see the primary diagnostic heading in the capital letters and they, they don't necessarily even read beyond that. So um, we, we, keep it fairly, we keep it fairly brief. They know what to do. Um, so what happened to this patient? Uh, well, um, she, for some reason that I don't know the answer to, she did not have a repeat FNA and she didn't have molecular testing. This case is probably now about five years old. Um, I guess because it was a fairly large nodule, it covered her entire right lobe. They went ahead and did a lobectomy, I'm sorry, a thyroidectomy. And she turned out to have an unusual outcome for somebody with an AUS cytology. Most AUS cytology is from patients who have benign thyroid nodules, but there is a risk of malignancy, probably on the order of about 10 to 20 percent. Uh, and this was one of the unfortunate patients who turned out to have a malignancy, and it turned out to be a follicular carcinoma that simply hadn't been sampled very well, or was so bloody that most of the specimen was lysed blood and we didn't get very much in the way of follicular epithelium. It was minimally invasive, and that's good news for the patient because these tumors are relatively um, well-behaved, uh, and she has a good prognosis. In fact, she was alive and well two and a half years later. So I want to talk a little bit about microfollicles. Uh, what are they? Because when, when I, I do a lot of um, resident and fellow teaching, and I find that in the beginning when people first start looking at thyroid FNAs, um, they have some trouble with the concept. And I think the problem is when you're dealing with a small group of follicular cells, thank you, that's not necessarily a microfollicle. The word microfollicle implies something small, but this is really just a small piece of a macro follicle. If you take the, no, nobody would argue that this is a macro follicle, correct? If you just cut a little corner out of this, what you'll get is that. So a micro follicle is not just a small collection of follicular cells. A micro follicle has to betray some aspect of neoplastic growth in the form of crowding overlapping and irregular distribution of nuclei around whatever structure it's forming. This is just a small piece of a macro follicle. These are the things that we would call micro follicles. Okay, so let me move on to the second case, which is an older woman. She's 76. Uh, she has a 3.4 centimeter isthmic nodule. 
Uh, her previous FNA was benign, but it's been growing a little bit, and so the endocrinologist decided to do a repeat FNA. Let me show you some images, and you can go back and look at them if you have some questions. Ah, right. We'll come back to that. So, <laughs> so of course, this is not a digitized slide, so I can't show you the entire slide, but let me just describe it for you. Most of the specimen, 95% of it looked like that and that, right? So these are macro follicles, a little bit folded here. So if you fold a sheet of a macro follicle, it does have this, this pseudo overlapping appearance, but you can easily recognize that because here it's not folded and these nuclei are nice and evenly spaced. So that's just a nice macro follicle. That's a small piece of a macro follicle there too. It's not a micro follicle. That's a nice flat sheet of watery or thin colloid. Another piece of a macro follicle here, some cystic change, right, macrophages. And then there was just this one group. Um, you wish you hadn't seen it, right? Um, and what do we have here? Uh, Pseudo-inclusion, right. Well, what are these cells and what, what is your diagnosis? So uh, it's not non-diagnostic, of course, because you've got a really nice cellular sample, you've got good follicular cells, most of it looks completely benign with normal macro follicles and colloid. Uh, so maybe benign. Uh, are you worried about that one group with the pseudo-inclusions? Uh, sure, why not? I think AUS is a reasonable diagnosis. Do you want to go all the way to suspicious for PTC? Probably not. So I think with this case, you have a choice of either uh, B or C. Um, the pathologist who signed it out in our department was not me, actually, um, but somebody whose name you might recognize, a really good cytopathologist, and uh, I think quite bravely and correctly, he called it benign and simply described those cells as cyst lining cells. And knowing, as he did with experience, that you can occasionally see pseudo-inclusions in benign cyst lining cells. So, um, I think with experience um, and the reassurance of all the rest of the slide looking completely benign, I think it's reasonable to call that benign, <clears throat> but um, I would certainly understand if somebody wanted to call that AUS. So let's talk a little bit about cyst lining cells. Um, I think they're fairly recognizable. Uh, once you've seen a few cases of it, I think um, it's a pretty straightforward um, thing to recognize. These are larger cells than normal follicular cells. They have an elongated shape, they have distinct cell borders, they have a lot of cytoplasm, um, but every now and then they can look pretty strange. And we certainly have called cases AUS uh, when there were lots of weird looking cyst lining cells. So we published a paper uh, a few years ago uh, with Dr. Faquin uh, as the first author, doing a histopathologic correlation. Um, and in some of these cases, we did actually find a correlate histologically to what we were seeing cytologically, these cystic spaces that were lined by these very plump uh, follicular cells that were thyroglobulin positive that had this sort of stretched out or reparative appearance. And for me, uh, this is the thyroid equivalent of reparative epithelium. Uh, so let me show you a number of images from our teaching collection. Here, here they are, these sort of elongated cells, very flat, very sharply outlined cell membranes. They look a little herthaloid, but, but they're much more stretched out than usual herthal cells are. They can have some fairly large and hyperchromatic nuclei. Uh, here's a medium power, here's a nice macro follicle fragment, and here off to the side, again, is this uh, sheet of what looks like reparative epithelium, but we call them cislining cells. Here's a right game sustained air dried preparation. Again, very flat for the most part. If they start piling up, then you will start worrying about them a little bit more. A beautiful sheet of cislining cells. Again, very flat. Notice how large these nuclei are, but they're fairly pale. They can have grooves. Uh, not just pseudo-inclusions, here again, this beautiful streaming or school of fish appearance. And they can look uh, quite wild sometimes, but again, what you're not seeing 
And you have to remember is most of the time, 99% of the slide looks completely benign. And this is usually a very focal finding. It's usually one or maybe two groups in an otherwise completely benign appearing thyroid FNA. Sometimes they look a little bit more epithelioid, as you can see here. This is when they are a little bit trickier to distinguish from Herthel cells. Again, usually these are few in number. All right, uh, so let's move on to case number three. Uh, and this is the only image I'm gonna show you from this case. This is an uh, older gentleman um, with a history of lung cancer and a pet avid thyroid gland and it's clearly a bloody smear. And I think those of you sitting close to the screen can probably see these nuclei a little bit better than those of you sitting in the back. I think it's a little bit unfair for you. Uh, but the question really here is, do you think that there's any atypia here? Yes. Um, and the people in the front are saying, yes, very good. I, I think there is too. This is my case. A little bit of irregularity of that nucleus. They look enlarged, they're a little bit pale. There's a groove right there, but that's, that's all I'm gonna show you, right? It was a pretty sparsely cellular sample, so what are you gonna call it? Well, if you believe that there's atypia there, you're not gonna call it A or B, right? So now your choices really are just AUS or suspicious for PTC. And again, I think with, like with the previous case, I don't think it's really enough to call suspicious for PTC. So this is a case that I did call <laughs> atypical. Virtually a cellular specimen, rare follicular cells with cytologic atypia, but too few and too obscured for blood by blood for further evaluation. So this is a case where you really think a repeat FNA and or molecular testing might really help you. Especially because it seems like this um, um, first FNA had some technical issues. Unfortunately, um, this is a personal consult and I don't have any follow up in this case, which is unfortunate, but that happens. Um, now the important point to make about this particular case is that I'm not calling this AUS because it's a bloody specimen. Just because something is bloody does not make it atypical. It would make it non-diagnostic. Um, this is atypical because you actually do see something here that bothers you. Uh, without that, you would never call this AUS, right? You just call this a non-diagnostic specimen, right? All right, case number four is a 53-year-old woman with a history of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and she has a 1.8 centimeter right thyroid nodule. I'll show you some images that are representative. I'll tell you, it was, it was moderately cellular. I think that's pretty much it. What's your diagnosis? Is it non-diagnostic? Is it benign? Is it AUS or is it suspicious for herpal cell neoplasm? So here, you have a choice of you have a choice, um, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So we actually called it AUS, and this is the note that we wrote: in a patient with Hashimoto thyroiditis, the findings might represent a nodule with herpal cell change. However, a herpal cell neoplasm cannot be entirely excluded. What happened to this patient? Well, again, what happened in this particular case was a bit of a surprise. It's not what usually happens to somebody who has an AUS interpretation. She did have a thyroidectomy two months later, and she turned out to have a Herthel cell carcinoma, a small one, 1.2 centimeters, that was minimally invasive uh, with complete transgression of the capsule, which you can see here. Here's the capsule here, normal thyroid there. Uh, again, these are fairly well uh, good actors, uh, these minimally invasive uh, follicular and Herthel cell carcinomas. Um, so she's likely to have a good prognosis. Um, <clears throat> so what I wanted to point out with this case is that in the Bethesda system, a moderately or markedly cellular sample comprised exclusively of Herthel cells can be called either AUS or suspicious for a Herthel cell neoplasm if the clinical setting suggests the possibility of a benign Herthel cell nodule for example, a patient with Hashimoto's thyroiditis or multiple thyroid nodules. Now, why, do, why did we say that in the Bethesda book? Well, um, 
we, we figured without very much data that there was a greater probability that those HERCL cell nodules were likely to be benign hyperplastic nodules in those settings. Since we um, published the Bethesda Blue Book, we now have some preliminary data to support that hunch that we had, although the data still, I think, are not entirely conclusive. So this is a study of just over 400 fine needle aspirations that fulfilled the criteria for suspicious for herthal cell neoplasm. They were all at least moderately cellular and made up exclusively of herthal cells. So multi-institutional study, we had follow-up in 72% of our cases and our overall malignancy rate was 24%, which is in line with the literature. The question we asked was, does it make a difference if somebody has Hashimoto's or not? And it appeared to make a difference. So our Hashimoto's co cohort was just 21 patients. And of those patients, only two of them turned out to have a herthal cell carcinoma. In fact, this case is one of those two cases. The other um, cohort that did not have Hashimoto's was a much larger cohort, and their malignancy risk was 25% in keeping with the general expectations for herthal cell neoplasm, but 10% is more on the order of an AUS risk than it is for a herthal cell neoplasm. Anybody in the audience want to guess whether this difference was statistically significant or not? Correct. This was, this was not, even though we had 400 cases of herthal cell neoplasms, we still didn't have enough patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis to make this difference statistically significant. So there's a, there's a trend here, but I wouldn't say that this data is conclusive uh, for, um, for this uh, question. It's a tough study to do. It's hard to get that many cases together. All right, case number five um, is a 64-year-old woman with multiple thyroid nodules um, one of them is three centimeters. It was previously biopsied. It was benign, but there was interval growth. All right, so take a look at a few images. So <clears throat> normal macro follicle fragment, right? Nice round nuclei, coarsely textured chromatin. We love that, evenly spaced, flat sheet. What are these cells? Anybody want to call them Herthal cells? Yes, they're Herthal cells, right. And they can look weird. They can have really big, dark nuclei. Um, again, <laughs> Herthal cells here, macrophages, so it's partially cystic. Uh, a nice small piece of the macro follicle there. So we have... Follicular cells, Herthal cells, macrophages, what's your diagnosis? It's benign, correct, right. Uh, anybody spooked by the Herthal cells? No, you shouldn't be. That, that's the whole point of this case. So this, so just because you have some Herthal cells and just because some of them have big dark nuclei with a nice nucleosis doesn't mean you should worry about that. That's a very common finding, especially in multinodular goiter. Um, in fact, that heterogeneous mixture of non herthal and herthal cells and colloid and macrophages is, is a very typical picture for a completely benign thyroid nodule. And she is alive and well seven years later. So these guys did not do any damage to her at all. All right. Any questions so far before I move on? All right. I just have uh, three more cases and we'll. I'll take some questions. Uh, this, this is kind of a fun case. So this, because uh, we see this with some regularity and it comes up all the time. This is a 53 year old male who has a 1.1 centimeter right thyroid nodule. It's barely big enough to biopsy, right? Usually we only biopsy nodules that are one centimeter or larger, except for un unusual circumstances. So this is the only slide I'm gonna show you and I'm gonna describe the case to you. 99% of the slide looked like that, right? And then there were two groups of cells that looked like this. This is one of them. I'm not gonna show you the other one. So this is like 1% of the entire specimen. Does it look a little bit different? Yeah, it does. You, you wish you hadn't seen these two groups. That's the problem with this case, right? Because you were just about to call it benign, right? Because you saw all these beautiful 
beautiful macrofollicle fragments. And then, damn it, the Cytotech had to dot those two groups for you, right? Um, so what's your diagnosis? Well, somebody said suspicious. That's pretty brave. I'm, I'm trying to paint this picture of a very benign looking nodule, right? Um, you, you have a point though. I mean, there, there, is, there are some nuclear features of PTC there. Uh, so I have to say I wasn't quite that brave. Um, and I called it AUS, follicular cells with focal cytologic atypia. They did a repeat FNA three months later, which was also AUS. So what happens then when you have two AUSs? Patient goes to lobectomy, right? So patient had a lobectomy. And what they found was multifocal PTC microcarcinomas. The largest focus was three millimeters. Here's one of them. Here's a higher magnification. So what basically happened was there's a benign nodule there. They just nicked a little bit of these microcarcinomas on the way in, and we got a little tiny bit of it. There's... There's your sort of benign nodule there, right? And there's your microcarcinoma there. That's what we were seeing as a tiny fraction. Did this patient have to have a lobectomy? We can argue that, you know. Um, the reason why, you know, I'm glad I didn't call it suspicious because certainly up until very recently, our thyroid surgeons were doing total thyroidectomies for a suspicious for PTC diagnosis. Uh, and I'm not sure the patient really needed to have a total thyroidectomy. In fact, they didn't. They just had a lobectomy in this particular case. <clears throat> now, of course, with NIFT-P, I think we may be seeing surgeons be a little bit more conservative with suspicious diagnoses and doing lobectomies rather than uh, immediately doing total thyroidectomies. All right, case number seven is a 78-year-old woman with two nodules. One of them is four centimeters, and the other one is two centimeters. And I think that's really all I have for you. So going back, there's that, and then that. Oh, there's one more. Now, this case was uh, actually photographed for the Bethesda Atlas. There's a nice tangible body macrophage. Did everybody agree that these look lymphoid? Yes, they're non-cohesive cells. So lymphoid chromatin, thick nuclear membranes. All right, and there's a cell block. We actually made a cell block on this case. Well, it, okay, it's not non-diagnostic, right? Um, and benign is a possibility. Could this be Hashimoto's thyroiditis? Well, why is it not Hashimoto's thyroiditis? How often do you have a four centimeter enlarging nodule in Hashimoto's thyroiditis? Even though cytologically it's not inconceivable, I think clinically you should be very skeptical and um, not, not to just write this off as a as Hashimoto's thyroiditis. But it's, it's a possibility. Um, AUS or FLUS or suspicious for lymphoma. I think that those are your two options here. So we actually did not, I didn't, it was my case, I did not call it suspicious for lymphoma. I called it AUS. I wasn't quite ready to go that far, although I was worried about lymphoma. We didn't have any immunophenotyping, so I suggested additional tissue sampling. Uh, for flow cytometry, but they went uh, ahead and they just did a thyroid mass biopsy, uh, which showed a beautiful marginal zone lymphoma with gorgeous lymphopathelial lesions. These, as you know, are follicles that are just completely destroyed and infiltrated by the lymphoma cells. Again, a low power uh, picture of this infiltrating uh, tumor and then these nice uh, lymphopathelial lesions or destroyed follicles. Uh, so <clears throat> one of the reasons why I kind of like AUS better than FLUS is because AUS allows you to, to use it for things that are not follicular, right? Because FLUS is follicular lesion, um, although that comes up extremely uncommonly. So, but here's an example of a case that you, I didn't think was quite enough to call suspicious for lymphoma. Um, and you have that opportunity to, to use AUS for that. Okay, last case. 26-year-old um, woman with a hard right thyroid nodule. Her previous FNA was non-diagnostic. Uh, 
I don't know if you can see the cytoplasm of these cells, but it's this is a very long spindle-shaped cell here. That one's got a very strange-looking nucleus. There's something right in the middle of that slide that's a clue to the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. How often do you see cells like this on a thyroid FNA? They're really unusual. I mean, maybe they look a little bit like macrophages, but, but these are awfully spindly looking macrophages uh, with strange looking nuclei. There's another little clue there off to the side. Um, <clears throat> so again, what are your choices? Are you raising your hand because you have a you have an answer? No, <laughs> just stretching. Okay, suspicious from a very good. Um, what what do you think it might be? Good. This guy got it. I'll yeah, I'll tell you the answer in just a second. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, we we were not that smart actually. This is not my case, um, but it was a colleague of mine, uh, and my colleague called it non-diagnostic because I think they just thought it it was macrophages basically so that was a that was a boo-boo well what happened here so patient did have a hemithyroidectomy three months later and this was a primary Langerhans cell histiocytosis of the thyroid an extremely rare tumor of the thyroid um, but here is the hemithyroidectomy and here's of course the positive CD1A uh, so we learned from this case and we wrote up three cases um, that we published a few years ago of this on fine needle aspiration. Uh, so this is my last slide. Let me summarize here and then I'll be happy to take some questions. So I've shown you eight cases, uh, six of which I think are sort of real AUS or FLUS cases. Uh, the first one was that sparsely cellular specimen that really had significant architectural atypia because it was pretty much all microfollicles. The second case had some atypia, but it was really hard to get a handle on how significant that atypia was because it was sparsely cellular and it was a bloody sample. Uh, the third was that, that cellular sample that's all herthal cells in the patient with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, the focal nuclear atypia that's a really tiny proportion of your specimen but you can't ignore it, the malt lymphoma that can be a very subtle diagnosis, uh, and then, of course, strange things that you can't recognize necessarily immediately, like this last case, which really was more for fun. So kudos to this guy right here. Raise your hand who got the diagnosis. <laughs> yes, thank you. Very good. Uh, and then I showed you two benign cases, the, the cis lining cells, and then the, just the prominent Herkel cells that are part of a heterogeneous mix of normal follicular cells and colloid. Um, of course, I think in the future, molecular testing, which is now widely used, is going to revolutionize our whole approach to uh, thyroid nodule evaluation. But that's a whole separate talk in and of itself, which I don't have time to talk about. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sebas, for this wonderful lecture. Oh, there's a question. Here. And uh, there are questions. Yeah, yeah Chiara? Or, yeah. Uh, so we have been using only thin prep in our lab for about 25 years. Um, we maybe, maybe not quite that long, maybe about 20 years. Um, there's a long story behind that. I'll give you the short version. Our, we used to we used to go down and do rows on all of our thyroid FNAs, but then our endocrinologists who do the biopsies moved their biopsy clinic off-site, and it was just far enough away that we couldn't go that distance to, to keep providing the rows. It was around that time, 20 years ago, when people started first reporting their experience with uh, liquid-based for thyroid. I read some of those papers. We did a validation study. We decided that that was the way to go. And so we just switched uh, to just uh, liquid-based. Um, the irony is that four years later, they moved their thyroid biopsy clinic back on site. 
but they were so happy with our results. And they liked the speed of just doing three passes and rinsing everything in cytolite without the rows, because we have a very busy thyroid nodule biopsy clinic. They never wanted to go back to making smears ever again. So we, we love it. I'm a big advocate of liquid-based cytology for thyroid. Um, I think there are some um, technical issues that are really important to know about. Um, and if anybody has questions about like the proper way to prepare a, a liquid-based cytology, I'd be happy to talk offline about that. As far as cell blocks go, um, we don't routinely do cell blocks. We used to, and we found that it didn't really add very much in 90% of the cases. Uh, so now what we do is we just make one thin prep slide. That's it. We, but we still have a residual sample. And if it's an unusual case um, where we think it might be medullary or if it's a question of a metastasis, we will make a cell block, but it, it's, it's a small proportion of the cases that we see. Yes, Rana. Thank you so much, that was a lovely overview. Um, so the question is, and I hope in your next version you have a gigantic chapter on inadequate, because that seems to be a, uh, the clinicians, sorry, Rana, for a CD attack. They don't like um, inadequate or non-diagnostic at all. That makes them really angry. And so, you know, people, different labs are trying to see how can they minimize. Because yes, you have these stringent criteria of six groups of whatever, 12 cells per group. And, you know, it's kind of hard to find. So people sometimes use their judgment. Um, if we see a lot of colloid and macrophages, we will call it a 2C, like a cystic, and not call non-diagnostic. Um, uh, and if we have two or three groups and we think they're benign, we still call it benign. And or sometimes we pre-prep, we make another slide to be able to get more. So how can you help with this non-diagnostic category, which is the biggest nuisance? Sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. It's a good question. So I have to say that um, I'm, I'm spoiled where I am because our endocrinologists are are really quite happy with our non-diagnostic rate, which is not zero by any stretch of the imagination. Our ND rate is about 12%. Um, and they, they're they quite happy with that. I'm, I'm actually very strict with the Bethesda criteria. I might stretch it to five. Uh, I'm on YouTube, I can't believe this is being broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say, I, I, I totally didn't say that. Um, but but no, I will, I'll never call something benign with just two groups of follicular cells. So I'm, I'm pretty strict. Um, in fact, I just called a case. Um, I, I got a case in consultation earlier this week um, that had, um, I think, it was 12 slides. It was 12 smears. Uh, there were lots of follicular cells on the slides, but they were all distorted by fibrin clots. So you really couldn't see the architecture at all. 12 slides, lots of follicular cells. I called it non-diagnostic because I couldn't, there were, because I want to see six groups of well-preserved, well-visualized cells, just like the cervical Bethesda system. They have to be well-visualized and well-preserved. And if I don't see that, I'm just going to call it non-diagnostic. So I'm actually pretty much of a hard ass when it comes to that. Um, I know that there are clinicians out there that will switch laboratories if you have a, non, if you if you call one thing non-diagnostic. So my, my perspective is a very, um, privileged one. I work at an academic institution where I have, um, I think, smart endocrinologists who understand the limitations of thyroid cytology and and are accepting of a 12% non-diagnostic rate. And I know that it's completely different in private practice. I'm afraid I don't have any insight to give you because I'm speaking from a from that perspective, Ron. Yeah. Yes. Um, are you using molecular at all? We are. So our endocrinologists are using the Affirma test. The Affirma. And how are, have you done any um, analysis of your ASCUS with the molecular and your uh, Um and Well, yeah, yeah. So the question is, have we, have we uh, published some papers? Uh, yeah, so we, we have. Um, and uh, we're, um, we're quite happy with it because we've, we've been able to confirm that it really does seem to have a very high negative predictive value. I think the, the value of the Affirma test is in its negative predictive value. Of course, it was designed for that. Um, it's a gene expression profile, as you know, that was trained to recognize a benign thyroid nodule. So it's, I think, quite good at that. And in our experience, it's never called 
it's never called something negative by a firm that turned out to be a malignancy, not in our hands at least, not in the literature. I think that's pretty close to being the truth as well. You're suspicious. So the suspicious is a different matter. So the, the Affirma calls about half of AUS cases roughly suspicious, right? And about half of the follicular neoplasm cases suspicious. So those are the two categories for which the Affirma test is recommended, AUS and then the suspicious for follicular neoplasm. And about half of those turn to be uh, Affirma benign and half of them are Affirma suspicious. The Affirma suspicious sort of raises the risk of malignancy a little bit but not very much higher, actually. Um, so um, our clinicians will take an AUS that's negative by a firma and just follow that patient. An AUS that's suspicious for a firma, they'll just repeat the FMA. Oh, they'll just repeat. They might do a low back. And I think, I think at that point, they're going to look at the sonographic characteristics and the clinical presentation, integrate all of that, and make a decision. So it's not quite a sort of a clear algorithm. You have to start integrating other things as well. Follicular neoplasm, if it's negative, they will sometimes follow, again, integrating the sonographic features. If it looks relatively small, well circumscribed, doesn't have very many malignant features. Otherwise, they'll do a lobectomy. But they would have done a lobectomy anyway if they hadn't done the affirma test, right? Because a suspicious for follicular neoplasm typically gets a lobectomy. So the, the suspicious affirma doesn't help you or hinder you with that particular category, in my so opinion. So what are you finding you're suspicious when you have surgical, so are they, is it, is it correlating, or are you finding them pretty bad? So, so, so the question is, so what are we finding with the suspicious affirmance? I have to say, I have not looked at that, and I don't know how they how they separate out from the non-suspicious affirmance. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Okay, can we can we have one question from our online audience? Oh, yes. sure. So we yeah, okay. so we got some questions from the broadcast. So Mona, uh, let's go with Norizov. She's asking, what are the typical features of herpes cells in PTC? The, the question is, what are the typical, typical features, features of herpes cells in PTC? Um, okay, well, um, there are PTCs that have oncocytic features, um, and that's not uncommon, actually. If you look at many papillary thyroid carcinomas, you'll see, at least focally, um, it's quite common to see some oncocytic differentiation. Those are not normal, of course, hurtful cells. Those are actually a variation of the PTC cells. I'm not sure if that's the answer to the question, that's, though. Yeah, the question how we got it. Yeah. But I, I may have misunderstood the question. Yeah. So Sorry about that. Nobody has any. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Um, do you feel that if TP can be diagnosed? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we've, so that's a good question. Did you all hear the question? Can we die? Do I think we can diagnose NIFT P on cytology? So we've been looking at that question now over the past year and a half quite carefully. And um, so look out for a few publications from our lab on that. So I, I don't think we can diagnose it specifically, no. But I think that we can, one thing I do think we can do is I think we can avoid putting NIFPs in the malignant category, which is what everybody's worried about. Now we're really worried that we're going to lower the predictive value of our malignant category because it's going to be diluted by this NIFP thing, right? Um, so my advice and what we've learned is um, limit your malignant category to the cases that have classic papillary carcinoma features. What do I mean by that? What I mean is if you have true fibrovascular cores, true papillae, that's probably, that's not going to be a NIFT-P because by definition NIFT-P has no papillary architecture. Uh, limit it to cases that have lots of pseudo-inclusions. NIFT-Ps rarely have easily recognizable pseudo-inclusions. Uh, if you have a case that's that's all microfollicular, purely microfollicular patterned case that has nuclear features of PTC, don't call that malignant. Call that suspicious for malignancy. Um, so I think that there are, there, are, there are tricks that we can play with the criteria that will keep us out of trouble with NIFT-P. I'm not sure that we'll be able to specifically make a diagnosis of NIFT-P ever by fine needle aspiration. Yes? Malignancy and not, um, ah, good point. Well, that, uh, that's a very good point. The question is, why call it suspicious for PTC? Why not call it suspicious for a follicular neoplasm? 
I think that that is an option, actually. Um, and in the next Bethesda edition, which we're working on right now, that category, suspicious for follicular neoplasm, is going to allow for some nuclear features of PTC. In the past, in the first edition, if you saw nuclear features of PTC, those cases were excluded from suspicious for follicular neoplasm. With the second edition, because of NIFT-P, we're going to allow you to use that category for cases with really minimal nuclear features. I think if the nuclear features, again, it depends on the degree of the atypia. If the clearing is widespread, if there's lots of grooves, if it really looks like a follicular variant of PTC, I think we're probably going to call it suspicious for PTC and hope our surgeons start doing more lobectomies. Um, but if the features are focal, not quite so widespread, I think many of us are going to call them suspicious for follicular neoplasm, like you suggest. Have you ever yes. seen a case of uh, Rosai Dorfman disease uh, in the thyroid uh, diagnosed on cytology? Have I ever seen a case of Rosai Dorfman disease uh, of the thyroid diagnosed on cytology? I have not. Have, have, have you? <laughs> no, I, I would love to see it. I'd love to see it. Um, I, I, I was hoping I, you'd say yes. Yeah. very suspicious for this right now. Uh, I'm curious about that. Uh, if, well, know, well, let me know if it turns out to thyroid. be. Of course, yeah, absolutely. No, I have not seen one. Uh, yes. Um, have you encountered any cases of uh, incidental parathyroid sampling? Oh. And would that warrant a diagnosis of AUS? What criteria would you look for? Have I ever seen a case of an uh, incidental parathyroid nodule on finding the last version of the thyroid? Yeah, it, ha it happens actually with some regularity um, because parathyroid nodules can be intrathyroidal and, or very close to the thyroid and they can mimic thyroid nodules. So, you know, in some of those cases, the clinicians will have some clue that it might be a parathyroid nodule. They may have, the patient may have some symptoms related to hyperparathyroidism. There may be some serologic studies that have already been done, elevated calciums, maybe even a PTH hormone, maybe not. Um, so if you have privy to that information, then if, that's where a cell block can be really useful because you can do immunocytochemistry and show that they're negative for thyroid globulin and positive for PTH. Half the time, in my experience though, we have none of that information. And what usually happens is you go down the tubes and you call it suspicious for a follicular neoplasm. Most parathyroid, not, um, <laughs> nodules, hyperplasias, and neoplasias tend to have a trabecular pattern or microfollicular pattern. They don't look like macrofollicles. They look more like microfollicles or trabeculae. So they're a really good mimic of follicular neoplasms. And that's been very well borne out in the literature. Yes, Rana? Nobody else has had a question. The two things about follicular. Um, first of all, do you have a percentage of um, what percentage of atypical thyroids would have um, some kind of mutation or clinical abnormality, just like CAP has said that 50% of ASCUS in GYN should be HPV positive. Um, Do you have? I asked a big person in molecular, and he didn't have an answer. Number one, number okay. two. Do you think that thyroid atypical is going to go the way of GYN atypical? That we be cut off from the middle and they go directly to molecular testing? Because again, I've heard that too. Like we will not be doing cytology, it will directly go molecular and you may get a percentage of some kind of non-significant mutation cases. So I'm not sure what you mean, but the, by the second question, Rana, how can you how can you cut out cytology? Otherwise you wouldn't know it was AUS. You have to have a cytology that showed AUS. Cases of ultrasound imaging, uh -oh. and if there hmm. are some atypical features like irregularity, hypervascularity, microclouds, they will do a, uh, they will do a molecular. And uh, if the molecular is negative, then you yeah. can get the uh, psychology. This is just something yeah. that people have said down the road, this is the future. But yeah. uh, how about that percentage of people sure. thyroids and molecular? Well, let me finish the second part of the question. So I, I actually have not heard any discussion about that. So, uh, but it wouldn't surprise me if, I mean, the future might be 10 years away, but um, if sonographic characteristics are getting to be so predictive of an abnormality that they can just bypass it. I, I haven't heard any talk of that yet, so I, I think it's not um, in the very near future. Uh, as far as the proportion of AUS cytologies that have a molecular signature, like a REC-PTC or a BRAF, a RAS mutation, 
Um, I don't know the answer to that, but that should be a fairly straightforward number to come by. I'm surprised that you're a molecular expert. Just could, I have a feeling I know who that is, but, <laughs> but, but it wasn't. He said 30%, yeah. but he did not know. He said he doesn't have a number. 30% That would be very nice to know, actually. Yeah, yes. And I think we should be able to, because now we're doing a lot of molecular testing, so that should be a number that should be easily accessible in the literature. There will be an overcalling on this one. I have a really Close yeah. To that question. The, the, okay. The last question, and I know there are many questions that needs to be answered, but uh, I think we'll have to start closing this meeting. It's, uh, yeah. Remember your um, things that um, not only did the ASCOS SIL ratio, but you also did the percent of uh, molecular on the ASCOS, and then you looked at the uncertainty versus the positive predicted value and stuff like that. You did on GYN. What's your view for this? And also, um, what's your experience or what's your percent? I was kind of annoyed by the 7% AUS guidance because the populations are different everywhere and we yeah. don't have a ratio. So what's your take on that and what's your experience and what's your, your views for the second edition? Uh, so that actually is going to be a very complicated answer. So let me, let me do you mind if I talk to you about that offline actually after this? Um, but my view about the 7%, can I address at least that part of your question? Um, we're going to change that with the second edition. <laughs> Thank you again for coming, and I would just like to uh, call Carrie to close the meeting for final <laughs> remarks. Uh, first and foremost, we'd like to thank Dr. Nara and Dr. Sivas for coming. We couldn't have done this without you, so thank you so much. Um, and everyone else, it was really a pleasure to have you all here and come together for the first Lennox Hill Phytopathology evening. So we hope to see you again, and thank you so much for coming. Be careful leaving. Don't trip over the chair.